to this course, which has been sponsored by Caulfield Shaw, uh, and uh, we welcome people from everywhere. So, uh, if you would recall, in the first uh, session, we talked about uh, Philo or Philo in the first century, the famous Middle Platonist, and his uh, enormous contribution to getting this idea of Jewish philosophy off and running. I'll remind us again: Jewish philosophy, primarily a reactive exercise to the uh, tremendous intellectual products that come out of the world around us, the philosophy being the uh, discoveries of what we can know through, through the mind and through our rational speculations, logical and otherwise. Uh, and then in the second class we looked at um, the enormous contributions of Sa'ad Jagaon, in the in the 10th century in the 900s his embeddedness in the kalam which is islamic philosophy and how he was able to extract and adapt many of the major ideas uh to really found some uh, important themes going forward in jewish thought and what uh, people normally do when they discuss the journey of jewish philosophy is that they tend to jump to the 12th century to the 1100s because we see the return uh, of uh, Western thought to Aristotle as a result of uh, the writings of the ancient Greeks having been carried over by the Arab world, now coming into Europe, now meeting Christian Europe, uh, and Aristotle makes a big return. So what often happens is that there's a little event that is skipped over, uh, and I want to focus on that today because we're going to look at the 11th century, we're going to look at the 10 hundreds, and this is really before uh, we're going to get caught up in Aristotle and Aristotelianism and that whole journey that's going to uh, take us in other directions uh, in the next session. But today I want to look at the very, very important thinkers who are coming from an intellectual background, philosophically speaking, that we call Neoplatonism. Now, Neoplatonism is a brand name that we give to a whole range of thinkers uh, from around about the 3rd century, from around about uh, the 200s, almost for the next millennium. They, uh, they would not have called themselves, of course, Neoplatonists. They would have called themselves Platonists. And let's remind ourselves of what the problem with Platonic thinking is if you're coming from the perspective of a revealed religion. If you're coming, remember that the whole exercise is to grapple with these two truth systems. On the one hand, philosophy is telling us what the mind can know, and religion is telling us what is revealed by the Word of God. And how do we reconcile these two? But even without religion, uh, Neoplatonists are trying to bridge the gap between the ultimate reality, and which is indivisible, perfect, and this one which is pluralistic and corrupt and so on. How do we bridge the gap? And we looked at various solutions. You know, we looked at, uh, at the Middle Platonists, um, Philo's Logos is a classic example of an intermediary. So is uh, Saaj's notion of the Kavod. But the Neoplatonists are taking a slightly different direction, very, very complex field of thought. But basically, what Neoplatonists are arguing is that there is an entire hierarchy of emanations that emerge from <laughs> the higher reality. And we know that uh, if already we're dealing uh, with the perception that the true reality is the spiritual realm, then we're already dealing in a platonic thought system. We're already in Plato's field, but we're bridging the gap by this process called emanation. At the top of this tremendous hierarchy sits the one. And it has been remarked that uh, where um, people have tried to say that the one is uh, that, that God is the one, Neoplatonists would actually say that one, the one, the number one, is actually God. God is uh, the one, is at the top of this hierarchy, completely 
uh, devoid of attributes. All our knowledge of attributes comes from perceived objects. So the concepts that can be derived from perceived objects cannot, we can't derive them when we talk about the one. It is absolutely transcendent. Uh, there are, but, but from the one emanates a great chain of being all the way down to earth in a gradual process of emanation where things become more and more materialized and more and more congealed. Neoplatonic thought, very complex. Normally there are uh, different types of entities. They're often talking about a, a divine mind or a divine intellect. Uh, a world soul. I'm going to show you an example. This is not specifically any particular Neoplatonic scheme, but I'm going to show you an example of what a, a Neoplatonic hierarchy of emanations. And all the way from the one, all the way down to earth. Uh, the other, uh, and, and, and one of the great metaphors that Neoplatonic thinking uses is this concept is, is is the concept of light so whereas the one is the source of light and then with these various gradations as they come down all the way down to earth the light gradually uh, not only becomes uh, congealed it becomes more hidden the neoplatonists did not believe that evil had any independent agency uh, but that in fact that evil is simply the absence or deficiency of light uh, the Neoplatonists also have a notion of the soul, not just a world soul, but individual terrestrial souls, and that the soul is on a journey where it is here in this world, but it is constantly yearning to return to the one. So, uh, those two aspects if you talk about the one and you talk about emanation you're already in the neoplatonic universe now i want to focus on if possible three thinkers one main one uh, that is coming within that tradition and is making once again incalculable contributions to the stream of jewish thought and we'll want to place this person or these people historically and I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, we had an amazing community in Spain in the uh, 10th and 11th and to some extent the 12th centuries, uh, which we call the Golden Age of Spain because uh, Jews in Spain under the Cordovan Caliphate and so on were really able to aspire to the highest levels of culture and art and literature and philosophy and so on. And it didn't take us long to produce some amazing thinkers in that environment. And I'm just going to show you now uh, what I'm talking about. Those of you who've done, the, uh, who've done my history course will know, uh, or who've done it recently, will be familiar with this. So let's look at this. And you can see uh, the golden age of Spain is here. And I just want to embed these thinkers uh, in their historical environment. And the first person I'm going to talk about, of course, is Shlomo Ibn Gabirol. And you can see that Ibn Gabirol is living smack in the Golden Age of Spain. He really is a classic exemplar of that. He's a contemporary of uh, Rabbeinu Gershom and Rashi, uh, and, and, and to some extent the Rif, if we're talking about the great Rishonim of Spain. And uh, the, um, if, if we get time, I'm going to talk about the other two, Bahya ibn Pakuda and Yehuda Halevi, who really uh, come one after the other. And they are all, particularly Shlomo ibn Gabirol and Bahya ibn Pakuda, are uh, examples, classic examples of uh, Neoplatonic thought and how Neoplatonic thought emerges into Judaism. Now, I know that some of you are sitting here going, Oh, but I'm Jewish and I have thoughts and I'm running around Platonism. What do I need to know about Neoplatonism? What has Neoplatonism done for me? But you'll see that in the ideas that we're going to discuss, particularly in relation to someone like Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, that his insights and his attempt to synthesize Jewish thought with Neoplatonic thinking have had such an incredible influence that we he's introduced concepts that we, for the last thousand years, have basically almost taken for granted within Jewish uh, He 
born in in uh, in well he born in uh, Malaga in Spain in the 11th century and he was of course famously a poet Shlomo Ibn Gabirol Yehuda Halevi they're all poets uh, they're not just streets in Tel Aviv they are actually incredible poets uh, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol is regarded possibly as the most sublime of all the poets of the golden age of Spain. In fact, uh, one of his most famous poem called Keter Malchut is in fact a huge philosophical neoplatonic uh, poem. I I Ibn Gabirol's biography is fascinating in itself, uh, but uh, where I want to take our starting point philosophically speaking, is that he obviously immersed himself in the uh, philosophy of the day. We have to understand about Neoplatonic thinking is that why is Neoplatonic thinking, this kind of spiritual, almost mystical underpinning for philosophy, is because Islamic countries are now ruling over far greater territories than they were before, including, including um, parts of the world that are much more exposed to Eastern thinking. And this is why some of the ideas of Neoplatonic thought have great similarity with the East. But Shlomo Ibn Gabiru grows up uh, with that particular uh, environment and he's reading widely and he is infused by Neoplatonic thinking. And as a young man, the first book I'm just going to look at quickly, and some people might say it's not strictly speaking philosophy, but I think it is. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we we have to remind ourselves that the purpose of philosophical thinking is not simply, not always to speculate about the big ideas out there, meaning the creation and the reality and all the different relations between objects and concepts and so on. But very often philosophy is a whole aspect of philosophy where we are looking at the inner self and we are looking at ethics and we are looking of how to behave. What can the human mind tell us about how to behave as human beings? The whole subject of ethics. And as a young man, uh, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol wrote a remarkable book called Tikkun Midot HaNefesh, The Correction of the Attributes of the Soul. is a clunky but accurate translation. And he wrote this in, uh, as in his early 20s. I mean, you imagine someone writing in their early 20s a book about how to be uh, a more refined and better person. It's not a very usual thing. And in this book, and, and, and we know that and he gives himself away as a Neoplatonist because in the introduction to the book, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol refers to God as Ha'echad Ha'kadmon Harishon the one, the eternal, the primordial, the first. And already we can see that he's edging towards this Neoplatonic perspective, not only of calling God nothing but the one, but that also God has essential attributes. That's the idea of Hakadmon, and active attributes, which means how the one emanates in relation to creation in which case the one is not going to be just the one, but is going to be the first. And in this text, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol does something very interesting, and, 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 and I'm going to highlight this because it's a fascinating aspect of, of, of the two books that we're going to look at, is that here is a text on morals and ethics that has no overt reference to Judaism or any other religion. Shlomo Ibn Gabirol writes a book that is fundamentally a universal text. It could be written, it could be read by anybody. It just simply focuses on how to be a better person. And it takes as its basis the idea that the human being is a microcosm of the universe. The human being is a microcosm of the universe. The universe is macro and the human being is a micro reflection of that. Very, very big idea that's going to come again into Jewish thought later on, particularly in Kabbalistic thought. But he's taking this in a purely philosophical sense. And what he wants us to do is he wants us to perfect the human 
through the things that make us human. And one of the things that is particular about being human, about being an animal in any sense, is the senses. The senses for him are not simply a part of the natural world that we have to grapple with. The senses themselves are emblems of a uh, perfect creation and they have their true essence. And what we have to do as human beings is recover the true essence of how to use our senses and each of the senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, are all connected and he connects them all with about 20 or so different attributes good and bad, that a person needs to perfect in order to uncover the true use of that sense. And I've got a graphic here I'm going to show you uh, to, uh, to demonstrate that. And uh, he's showing, so if you, uh, if, if you can uh, purify and reify each of these senses, you are restoring them to their absolute emblematic reflection of uh, of the universe of the macrocosm and you become uh, you are returning in a sense to your true essence because one of the things that and you can see that each of these uh, senses has um, an aspect to it that that the positive and negative aspects four attributes associated with it, with each one because as I said one of the things that the neoplatonists are very concerned with is this idea of the return of one's individual soul towards the one. And you don't do that by escaping from your senses. You do that by purifying your senses, by elevating them, by uh, turning them into uh, emblems of the true reality, the true spiritual reality. So he allies behavioral attributes to a notion of uh, the underlying spiritual reality behind the universe. It's a very, very deep book, sometimes not always uh, looked at in the ways that are given the, the weight that I think it has within Jewish thought. And he wrote that in his early 20s, and that's kind of unusual as well. But the main book I want to talk about today, and uh, all of which is really by way of introduction, is an astonishing work which uh, for most of the last millennium, we did not know was written by a Jewish thinker. There was a Latin text that passed through the Middle Ages and beyond uh, called Fons Vitae, which means the source of life. And it wasn't until the 19th century that scholars such as Solomon Munch and others realized through finding manuscripts and all of their research unequivocally discovered that this Neoplatonic text called Fons Vitae, which was regarded by Christian and Muslim scholars right throughout the Middle Ages as a really classic and amazingly pure statement of Neoplatonic thought, and Christians thought maybe it was a Christian, the Muslims thought maybe it was a Muslim, but scholars in the 19th century discovered that Fons Vitae was in fact the Makor Chaim, of Shlomo ibn Gvirol, a book called Makor Chayim, meaning, as what Font Vite means, the source of life. And Makor Chayim is a remarkable book because Shlomo ibn Gvirol clearly challenged himself to write a philosophical text that, and, and listen to what I'm saying, because it's remarkable. People just don't easily do that this today. To write a philosophical text that was both completely universalist, meaning it was could speak to anyone, but was at the same time completely consistent with Jewish thought and values. And that's not simple, because as you might have heard, Judaism often gets very caught up in particulars, in the particularity of the Jewish people, in the particularity of what we have to do in the world, uh, the particularity of the Jewish journey. Judaism has many, many universal statements, but they're not. it's not easy to write a philosophical text that's consistent with Jewish thought and at the same time will speak to everyone. That's a, an interesting facet. There's no quotations from the Bible. 
There's no overt references to Judaism. Uh, the only philosopher mentioned is Plato, and it is a pure analysis of the Neoplatonic view of reality. And here's what's unique about it. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that Shlomo Ibn, Ibn Gabirol wants us to understand that in his philosophical uh, speculations, there are three really important topics that we need to understand. Uh, one is the divine essence, which could also be called a primal cause. And I've got to tell you that, as strange as this might sound, um, the divine essence is not entirely synonymous with the one. It kind of is, but already if we're talking about a concept called divine essence, we're already saying something about the one. So we're already at a first level of emanation when we talk about divine essence, but it's a very important topic Shlomo Ibn Gabir wants us to understand. He also wants us to understand the concept of divine will, which is the next emanation after essence. But the really, really, really big subject he wants us to get our head around, and uh, in the time we have today, it's not going to be that simple, but it's the concept of matter and form. Everything in the universe is composed of matter and form. Now, you might come along and say, David, well, that's, that's, that's hardly new. We knew that. But for Shlomo Ibn Gabirol takes this subject, takes this concept of everything in the universe is composed of matter and form. It's a fundamental dualism grappled with by Aristotle, by Plato. We looked at this uh, in, the first, um, in the first session. Uh, where exactly you place the introduction of, of, of the concepts of matter and the concepts of form, are they eternal, where do they join, and so on. Uh, for Aristotle, for example, there is, no, there is no mixing of matter and form except here. All the different levels of form only emerge in matter in this corporeal world. Uh, for Plato as well, matter and form do have some kind of sublime combinations, but they are uh, only happening in relation to this particular reality. But for Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, matter and form, uh, well, well, he's, he develops, I think, that later scholars called universal hylomorphism, meaning that all of reality, matter, material, spiritual, everything, is really only one substance. And that substance is a combination of matter and form. Now, I'm going to show you a graph because I'm going to show you where that merging of matter and form uh, come about. And it is, uh, let's see. Now, matter and form are really two dual starting points for all of reality. And what holds them together is the divine will. The divine will, even before we get to the divine mind, the divine intellect, even before we arrive that in our scheme of, inf of, 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 in our scheme of emanation, divine will is combining form and matter. And as you can see here, and I've, it's a complex graphic because, uh, and you won't see this anywhere else, but I have distilled this idea from Makor Chaim, is that really, on another level, matter is a real consequence of divine essence. It's divine essence that really creates matter, and divine will creates form. Divine will then holds matter and form together. And the entire chain of being is going to be gradations of the combinations of form and matter. Now, why is that important? That's important is because it is divine will or divine desire, as sometimes uh, Shlomo Ibn Gabirul wants us to understand it, that is holding matter and form together at every single level, which means that divine will 
is the permeating force behind everything in reality. Not just, it's not just the case that the divine will is up there and we're all consequences down here, but that divine will permeates all the way through reality, right down to every single conceivable object and entity in the universe is combined of form and matter. And that form and matter is held together by divine will. And Shlomo Ibn Gabiril is also talking about <laughs> the soul because the soul wants, in classic Neoplatonic fashion, the soul wants to return to the one. And that is humanity's ethical imperative. Humanity is given, and he comes back to tikkun, the ideas of tikkun midot nefesh. Humanity, a human being, the soul of a human being, is given access to the senses in order to attain the knowledge of forms. And by the knowledge of forms in matter, we reify our souls and return to our true essence. Not like the Gnostics would say that we have to escape this reality, but within this reality, we can become more and more our true selves, which are a humanity is a direct uh, reflection of the macrocosm and uh, has a direct royal road, if you like, to connecting to the one, to connecting to the divine reality. And we do that uh, through our senses, through purifying our senses, through reflecting upon how the various senses of the human being can be conduits for that divine reality. So Makor Chaim is a very, very complex book. Uh, there's a, sometimes this idea of form and matter can, uh, can get away from people. I mean, Keter Malchut, once again, is a, is, a, is an immense poem that is reflective of these ideas. Uh, one way of understanding is that uh, Ibn Gabirol gives us a, a, an analogy, gives us a mashal inside uh, Makor Chaim, where he talks about uh, how creation is spoken. Uh, he, he doesn't refer to the biblical or uh, Jewish thought idea about, uh, specifically about the universe being a creation of God but he uses voice as an analogy, the divine speech, whereby, for example, the notion of voice would be matter and the words and letters that form words would be the form and the meaning of what's being said would be the resultant divine intellect or the noose could be understood in relation to uh, that combination of voice and and words or, or the, the sound patterns that are imposed on voice, the form coming into matter, deriving meaning. But that's just an analogy he gives us. I'm trying now to uh, clarify this. It's not easy to talk about Shlomo Ibn Gabirol too extensively in, this particular, in a session of this length. But if we understand the notion that uh, of the one. We understand the notion of emanation and particularly the understanding the notion of form and matter and divine will permeating all of reality. These are ideas that, and uh, the, more I, the more I see of Shlomo Ibn Gabirol and as a student of Kabbalistic literature, I know that scholars are always saying, oh, Shlomo Ibn Gabirol didn't really influence the Kabbalah, but everywhere you look in Kabbalistic thought, you can see ideas that are reflective of Shlomo Ibn Gabirol's picture of the world. So Neoplatonism is really a very, very heavy influence inside Kabbalistic thought. And I don't need to tell a, uh, an intelligent and good looking audience like this, just how pervasive and influential Kabbalistic literature is. I've got a few minutes. I'm gonna talk about the next person I wanted to talk about because it's very, very interesting. And that is Bakhtia Ibn Fakuda. And uh, I'm just going to go back now for a second to, you can see Bakhya Ibn Pakuda, who's really sitting uh, between Shlomo Ibn Kabirol and Yehuda Halevi. I mean, as you can see, uh, everything is about to change in Spain. I mean, Bakhya is already living through the first Reconquista, uh, the Almohads around the corner. Yehuda Halevi 
is going to be living in that time between the Reconquistas. That's going to define his intellectual projects and concerns. But Bakhtia ibn Pakuda is a classic Neoplatonic thinker who is concerned primarily uh, with ethics. And that's what really makes someone, at the end of the day, a Jewish philosopher, is that at the end of the day, we live in this world, and how can we be better people? How can we create uh, an inner self that is more reflective of the divine, that is a better person? And he writes a book, famous, famous text, called Chovot Halvavot, The Duties of the Heart. Well, that's what it ended up being called in its Hebrew translation. He wrote it in Arabic. And he took a lot of the forms and styles there from similar literature in the Islamic world that wasn't seen as an issue. They had some very, very high-level literary forms. He's concerned very much with the concept of the unity of God, meaning trying to abstract God from anything of the adjectives or attributes that we can say about the divine. And in doing so, he distinguishes between two different types of attributes, those which are essential, really where uh, we can't talk about God at all, God's essential attributes, and active attributes, that is the way that God interacts with, react, with, with creation. This is a basic distinction that had already been made by Sa'ad Jikahon, and how we can understand problems of anthropomorphism and descriptions of God, and how we can even talk about God and so on. What Bakhya ibn Pakuda's great contribution was in Chovot Avavot, in, in my humble opinion, is to take that perspective on the divine and relate it to the human being through the commandments of the Torah. The Torah has different types of commandments. It has commandments that are uh, to do with how we relate or, or how we act, whether they are ritual commandments or social commandments. They involve us interacting with the world and other people. But there are also commandments that are purely internal. When the Torah says to you, you know, don't bear a grudge or don't take revenge or don't lust, after things, or don't hate people. These are internal emotional uh, attributes of an individual that are still nevertheless commandments of the Torah. And Bakhya ibn Pakuda, and listen carefully because this is remarkable, but Bakhya ibn Pakuda makes a, gives us a tremendous insight. And it's this. In relation to the all the different other ritual and social commandments, you can understand them or you could not understand them. They might lend themselves to rational comprehension or not. But all of the duties of the heart, all of the things that we need to do as human beings to, and we are commanded to do by God that involve internal processes are all rooted in the intellect. They are all capable of reason. They are all capable of arriving at philosophically and therefore we have a duty to arrive at them rationally and reasonably and to work with our minds to understand the importance of fixing those attributes and purifying ourselves as human beings. It's a huge insight. In other words, regardless of how many commandments of the Torah you understand, you are perfectly capable of working with your mind rationally to improve yourself as a human being in terms of your inequalities. This is a huge insight. is a it's an enormous text. It feels almost obscene to summarize it in just a few minutes. He goes into... Uh, almost every aspect of moral behavior and so on. It really, really is a classic of Jewish thought, but it is grounded, its perspective on the world is grounded in Neoplatonic thinking. And Neoplatonic thinking, which had evolved, first of all, from Plotinus and through Porphyry and Proclus, and I didn't mention this before, all the great thinkers of the Neoplatonic tradition, but they are all there on the bookshelf and uh, you're welcome to read them. I always recommend people going back to 
platinus every few years just to uh especially people that uh that don't uh that don't take uh, mind altering substances uh, probably could do with a bit of platinus because it's a good substitute for that now uh, the third uh, thinker that I just want to briefly touch upon is the uh, third in that uh, in that series, that and that is uh, Yehuda Halevi. And in some ways, Yehuda Halevi doesn't need any introduction, but we'll introduce him nevertheless. He is an enormous poet, living uh, right at the end of the golden age of Spain, because uh, he's going to see he's going to witness the Al Muhad. Um, uh, sweeping through and he's going to try and go to Israel and he's got a whole legendary history as well. Uh, and why he is of interest to us as a philosophy, uh, in, in a course on philosophy, is because apart from the fact that he has his own Neoplatonic perspectives, but uh, as you would be aware, Yehuda Halevi wrote a famous, famous book called the Kuzari. And in the Kuzari, he romantically envisages uh, a discussion that had happened uh, several hundred years before when uh, Bulan, the king of the Khazars in the 8th century, had basically converted his state religion to Judaism. And in advance of this, in the, respect, uh, in the speculative romance of Yehuda Halevi, he had invited to discuss with him he, that the king had had a dream. He had a dream that God said, oh, I'm happy with your intentions, but I don't like your actions. You need to find yourself the right path. So he invites a, a Christian priest, uh, an Islamic imam, a rabbi, and a philosopher. And he has discussions. And of course, uh, the vast majority of the text is involved in his discussions with the rabbi because eventually he converts to Judaism. But the first few pages, he's dealing with uh, everything else. And uh, it's very interesting that Yehuda Halevi's philosopher presents very, very cogent arguments. And, and, and even in the couple of, just a couple of pages that the Kuzari is dealing with philosophy, you can see that the classic philosophical position that Yehuda Halevi is presenting on behalf of philosophy is fundamentally a Neoplatonic position because that would have been the, uh, the guiding kind of uh, philosophical picture in Spain in the Golden Age. Uh, with the addition, by the way, of uh, because now you know we've had uh, uh, we've had Avicenna and we've had other thinkers who have started to introduce a little bit more pure Aristotelianism into the medieval picture. So he's already talking about a concept that we're going to be talking about in a couple of weeks: uh, the concept of the active intellect, very big for the Rambam and so on. And already that's just starting to creep into the picture. And it's interesting because the philosopher's arguments are basically agreed to by the king as a picture of reality, but they are refuted because they do not contain any guidance for life. They don't really tell the king what he's meant to do. And also importantly, and this is big for Yehuda Halevi, philosophy cannot arrive at prophecy. In other words, you can perfect yourself as much as you can, as this philosopher in the book had, but philosophy doesn't produce prophets. It doesn't produce people who are direct, expressive conduits of the divine will. And we're going to see this in the next century with the, with the welding of Aristotelian thought into Jewish thought. It's we're going to try and define what prophets are because Judaism is so dependent upon its prophetic tradition for the revealed word of God. So how does prophecy fit into this whole picture of the universe? It has to be explained rationally. And because philosophy couldn't account for prophecy, as well as the fact that it couldn't even really tell the king uh, what he should be doing as an active praxis, in the world is that ultimately philosophy was rejected by the king, but the picture presented by the Kuzari, and I urge you all to read the Kuzari, because it's a foundational text of Jewish thought, uh, is nevertheless Neoplatonic and a classic picture of the way in which philosophy progresses throughout the Middle Ages. So uh, what I wanted to do today was to cover the Neoplatonists. I wanted to look at Shlomo ibn Gabirol, Bachya ibn Pakuda, and Yehuda Halevi as making 
tremendously foundational contributions to the journey that we're going to go on. It's very difficult to understand subsequent Jewish thought unless we take account of those thinkers, and I'm very pleased we have the opportunity to do that today. Uh, I know that I have been very, very summary in my uh, discussions today, but hopefully uh, we've opened the door to further thought because I think there will be a return to the thought of Shlomo Ibn Gabirol in Jewish thought. I don't think that we have fully absorbed and accounted for his incredible picture uh, as outlined in Makor Chaim. And it does show, and I'll just finish on this point, is that Judaism is perfectly capable of producing universalist statements, universalist statements that can speak to all of humanity, but grounded ultimately in the Jewish idea that at the end of the day, we have to improve ourselves as human beings in the world. So thank you for listening to that, and I will see you soon. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon.